Um, let me pray for us and just get our hearts right before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've spoken to us through your word. God, I pray that you would um, allow it to take root in us. God, use it to change us, transform us, send your spirit to illuminate it to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. All right, everything we're talking about through the summer, beginning last week, has to do with what it means for Grace Chapel to move more and more toward becoming a disciple-making church. And if you call Grace Chapel your home church, our desire is that you would be a disciple and make disciples, that you would actually fulfill the Great Commission, because the Great Commission wasn't just given to professional church people, it was given to every single person who calls themselves a follower of Christ. Now, Pop quiz, who can help me answer this question? I'm not going to give you the answer today. Who can answer the question, what is a disciple? I've got a prize for you, actually. What is a disciple? Who can answer it? Okay, yes. Way to go. Woo! Winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's awesome. Yes, a disciple. Just so we have common language, a disciple is somebody that is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on the mission of Jesus. And this series we're specifically talking about in the Gospel-Centered Life, we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to center your whole life on who Jesus is, on what Jesus did, the good news of the Gospel. And uh, what we said last week is that the gospel is not advice which puts burdens on you. The gospel is news which removes the burdens from you. It's good news which lifts the burdens off. It's, it's not about what you must do. It's, uh, it's about what God has already accomplished for you in the person of Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. Many Christians believe that the gospel is the way that you enter into the Christian faith and then you sort of leave it behind and move on to the deeper things. It's sort of the, the, the belief that it's an elementary doctrine that you move on from. And I'm telling you that, that that belief is one of the, if not the primary reason why there's an epidemic of spiritual immaturity in the American church today. The belief that the gospel is just the way that you enter into Christianity and not something that influences all of your life. And specifically today, I want to help us understand how the gospel actually influences, revolutionizes, changes the way we approach our work, our vocation. Uh, in fact, Dorothy Sayers in her essay, Why Work, it was published in 1942, she wrote this. She says, and nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? And she was right then, and she's right today, still. The, the church has sort of failed to instruct people, preachers and teachers like me, have failed to instruct people on how the gospel actually works its way out in your vocation. So what, what I want to do today is help you gain a biblical view of your work. Because believe it or not, whether you are a financial advisor or a farmer, whether you are crunching numbers or changing diapers, the gospel has enormous implications for your work. And if you understand what the gospel means for your work, it will completely change the way you think about it, the way you feel about your work, the way you treat people at your work. It will completely revolutionize how you actually do your work. So let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Uh, so many of the foundational Christian doctrines are found in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 and uh, work is no exception. So let's look at Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 28, and then a couple of verses out of chapter two. It says this, Genesis 1, 26. 
Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And Genesis 2, starting in verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God put the man and put him in, uh, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So out of these passages, we're gonna talk about the fact that we're made to work, how we work, and the reasons why we work. Let's talk about being made to work. You know, throughout history, there are, there are a lot of different accounts of uh, different versions of a, a, sort of a creation story, the creation of the world, creation of mankind. And in fact, uh, the, there's a famous sort of Eastern um, Babylonian creation story where uh, in, in that telling of the creation story, all of these gods are at war with one another. And Marduk, who's one of the gods, he, he is victorious in this battle and ends up creating the world in order for the gods to sort of inhabit it as a place for them to, to, to be. And after he does this, he creates it. All the other gods get into the world and they're grumbling and complaining and they're going, Marduk, th this is, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but he says, Marduk, th th this is gonna take so much work to maintain and keep up with this place. We don't wanna do it. And so Marduk says, okay, well, I've got a solution. I'm gonna create a lowly and primitive being called man who's gonna do all the menial work for us so we can just rest because this work is too lowly for the gods. And so the Eastern view of work is that it's, e it's evil. Physical labor is bad. It's to be, be avoided. It's too, uh, it's too menial. It's too lowly for the gods to do. Now, if you look at Western accounts of creation, especially uh, uh, Greek, that's the story of uh, Zeus. Zeus gives Pandora a box. Well, it's a jar, actually. We call it a box. He gives Pandora a box. He says, whatever you do, don't open the box. What does she do? She opens the box, right? And what comes out? Death, disease, decay, destruction, and work. Work is included with all, so both Eastern and Western creation stories view work as evil, as lowly, as bad, as destruct something that's a result of basically the fall of, of sin entering into the world. But what we see in the biblical creation account is God with his hands in the dirt working. He forms mankind out of the dirt, breathes life into him, steps back and says, that's pretty awesome. He takes pleasure and satisfaction in his work, right? And, and what the biblical creation account does is, is it actually demolishes both Eastern and Western creation accounts. And, and one of the things that's interesting is there are Christians who believe that work is a result of the fall, of sin entering the world. But what we see in, in the biblical creation story is that work is not a punishment, it's put in paradise. Right? God takes Adam and Eve and he, he puts them in the garden. And think about this. They, they have relationship with one another. There, there's, uh, there's friendship, there's community, there's intimacy, there's trees that are you know, the garden is beautiful to look at. It's beautiful to the eye that there is good food there. God is walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. There's community there. There's friendship. And on top of all of that, God puts work in paradise. 
He gives them a purpose in all of it. And it's not just intellectual work. It's not philosophical work. It it is manual labor. They've got to work the ground. And, And what God does at the very beginning of the human story is he elevates a type of work that in modern culture, most people would look at and say, that's menial work. God elevates it and says, no, 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 this isn't menial, this is sacred. This has inherent dignity and value. And if you're honest, maybe you would never say this, but there is a type of work that when you think about it, you think, oh, that's too lowly for me. That's beneath me. And God says, no, 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 all work has inherent value. And let me just clarify, there are a few exceptions apart from work that is inherently sinful. So just to be clear, being a drug dealer is not inherently dignified and valuable to the world, right? All work is a calling, being a drug dealer is not a calling. Okay, you might be called to be a salesman and the devil has twisted that into something that it was never meant to be. But all work that isn't inherently sinful is a calling from God. It has inherent value and and dignity. And on top of all of that, the gospel story, it tells us of the love of a God who sent his son, who came down not as a philosopher, as uh, maybe the, um, as the Greeks would have expected him to be, or uh, the Romans might have expected him to be a nobleman or a, states, a statesman, or even as a great general, as the Jews wanted him to come down as, so he could free them from Roman oppression. God didn't come down in any of those ways. Jesus came down. What was his vocation? He was a carpenter. He, he was a woodworker, or depending on how you translate the text, a stonemason. But either way, he's getting into the work with his hands. Right, and he did that for the majority of his life. Only three years of his life was spent doing the, 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 his, his ministry. Right, so the majority of his life, God is working with his hands. So what that means is if you are a ditch digger or a homemaker, if you're a lawyer or a salesman, if you're a CFO or a janitor, no matter what your vocation is, your work is a calling from God. Now, that begs the question, if that's true, if our work, whatever that work is, is a calling, how should we do our work? So let's talk about how we work. Now, some of you, um, as I set up the the topic, maybe you were and maybe still are a little bit terrified that I'm, I'm gonna tell you that, you know, tomorrow you need to go into your workplace and just start evangelizing everybody. And maybe you need to be a little bit more open about your faith Maybe, as we'll see in a second, maybe you just need to stop talking about Jesus for a second. Oh, the preacher just said that. Yes, you'll understand why in just a moment. Okay, let's, talk, let's just ask the question. Let's step back and ask the question. How should a Christian who is an airline pilot do his job? What should he do? Land the plane. He should do a great job of flying the plane, of landing the plane, of actually doing the work of an airline pilot. He should be a great airline pilot. How should a CFO who is a Christian do their job? Manage the money. How should a plumber who is a Christian do their job? Plumb the stinking pipes, literally. Like just do a great job plumbing the pipes. Right, get everything, do a great job. See, in the, in the church, we've made the mistake of thinking that everybody that can go into vocational ministry should. And I actually don't believe that to be true. I actually think it's the opposite. Not that you should avoid vocational ministry like the plague. By the way, everybody who is a follower of Jesus is in ministry no matter what your vocation is. Amen? Okay. So, what the world needs... It is not everybody that can go into vocational ministry to do it. What the world needs is Christians who are doing great work out in the world. Who, when they, whether they're a businessman or a, a, a stay-at-home mom, that whatever work they're doing, they're doing it well. They're doing it with excellence. They're doing a great job. I want you to see this. Look what Paul says to the Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. He's talking about 
uh, loving one another well. Do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. What he's saying is everybody shut up, mind your business, get to work. That's what Paul's telling. There's a lot that Paul's dealing with, but why does he say that? Look at the reason. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Literally, he's saying, so that you might win the respect of those who don't follow your Jesus. That you might win the respect of outsiders. Are you guys alive today? Is there a pulse in the room, somebody? Okay, we're tracking. All right, good. Can I just tell you, so in in light of that context, if you are constantly sharing Jesus with people in your workplace and you are terrible at your job, you need to stop talking about Jesus and get good at your job. Because every single day you're giving people a reason not only to not listen to you, but also to not listen to your Jesus. It's, It's called the ministry of competence. Maybe, maybe you just need to find a different job. I, I don't know. But if you're not good at your job and you're constantly trying to evangelize people, listen, you, you just stop and focus on getting better at your job. Get competent at your job. Right? But if you're great at your job and you are doing things with excellence, what, what is going to end up happening is people eventually, if you do your job competently and excellently, people are eventually gonna come to you and begin to ask you some questions. And I'm telling you, you will be given an opportunity to share Jesus with people if you are great at your job. It will come to you. You don't have to force it on people. Years ago, I took a job in a company as a... um, uh, uh, inside sales coordinator, which, so uh, just a few of my job responsibilities. I was uh, analyzing data and uh, doing competitor research in order to support an inside sales team for an HR consulting firm. And if you know me, sitting in a cubicle in front of a computer screen, nine to five, five days a week, it took me about six months. And I, I'm just going, man, I, my soul is literally shriveling up and dying. Now, there are some people that are created after first service. Somebody came up and goes, I'm literally a data, a data a- analyst, and I love my job. I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. God created you to do it. He did not create me to do it. And I learned that about myself, right? And, and so there's a part of this where you, you have to figure out how God has wired you and gifted you and what he's called you to do. Right? And so if you're here and you're going, well, how do, I, how do I know if I'm in the right vocation? How do I know how to find the right vocation? Let me just give you, it's very simple, very quick, memorable. This is how, this is one way to look at how you align with what God has wired you to do and what he's calling you to do. So look in, look out, and look up. Look in. What am I good at? What has God wired me to do? What am I passionate about? Uh, what do I enjoy doing? What, what is something that, that I actually care about doing and that I'm good at doing? So look in, figure out how God has wired you. And Pastor Myron, as we said, does a great job helping us just do like spiritual gifts inventory, that there's different ways to figure this out, even looking at what other people, when you do something, if people are affirming you in that thing, it's a sign that maybe God is calling you into that. So look inward, how has God wired you and made you? And then look out. So you can be passionate about something that actually doesn't meet a need in the community. So you have to look out in the community and ask the question, what do people need? How, how, what can I do that serves people and blesses people and actually helps people out in the community? What can I do to serve and bless? Right? And, and this is one of the reasons why so many of us are not actually satisfied in our work is because we made our work about us and your work was never meant to be about you. It's not about you. It's about you serving and blessing people out there. It's working toward the common good of all people, right? So look in, look out, and then look up. Is there a sense of kingdom mission in your work? And I'm not talking about the tasks, like everybody has tasks in their work that they have to do in order to do their job. 
What I'm talking about is the end result. Is this creating space for you to actually be about the kingdom of God as you are accomplishing your tasks? Right, So there's the task of the job, and then there's the broader purpose, the mission behind the job. And do you sense God's kingdom mission in the world being accomplished through what you are doing? Because you've been given your vocation for a purpose. It's a calling, okay? So now, let's talk about the reasons why we work, and we're going to spend the bulk of our time on on this part right here. So why we work. And I, I want you to know that I know no matter how much you love your job or no matter how great your job is or how perfectly aligned your job is with your wiring, meeting needs of others and how on mission it is, there are seasons in any job where it can be incredibly frustrating. Um, You just sort of lose some momentum or some joy in your job, whether it's pressure or stress or your coworkers are just getting on your nerves or whatever. Maybe your boss is treating you unfairly or whatever it is. There are seasons of life in whatever your vocation is where that is going to be the case. So don't think that I'm saying that if you just find the perfect vocation that you and your vocation will live happily ever after. This is, this is a, part, a part of the result of the fall is that there is this anxious toil that's mixed in to the work that God has called us to do. And, and that's what I want to talk about for a few moments here. In our passage, uh, we're actually given a way to have a level of joy and consistency and stability and freedom in how we approach our work. And and I want us to see this here in a moment. Uh, Years ago, after winning his third Super Bowl, Tom Brady, he was in in an interview and uh, he basically says, you know, they're asking him, they're going, oh, you know, you're famous, you have all this wealth and you're at the pinnacle of success and what's it like and da da. And he, he looks at him and it's haunting to watch. He looks at him and he says, this is all empty. It's empty. It's, it's not what I thought it was going to be. I thought this would fill me. I, I don't know what the solution is. I don't even know where to look, but this is not what I expected. It, it's incredibly haunting. Um, Madonna in Vogue magazine, which I'm a regular subscriber I'm glad you laughed because that was a joke. Uh, Years ago in an interview said, every time I accomplish something, I feel like a special human being. But after a little while, I feel mediocre and uninteresting again. I find I have to get myself past this again and again. My drive in life is from the horrible fear of being mediocre. I have to prove I'm somebody. In the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, Harold Abrams, who runs the 100-yard dash in the Olympics, he says, I only have 10 seconds to justify my entire existence. And what all of these people are, they're saying the same thing, just in a different way. What they're saying is, I'm doing my work for me. My work is about me. I need something from my work. I need to know that I'm somebody, that I have value, that I matter, that I have an identity, that I'm worth something. In other words, my work is about me. And if we're honest, every single person in in this room, there's not one person that approaches their work with 100% purely selfless motivation. Okay. But, But one of the dangers is, one of the dangers is that the primary reason why we're working so hard, why our culture, our society is working themselves into the ground, working themselves into a mental health crisis, for goodness sake, or the reason why we're working so hard that we're neglecting our marriages or our children or our families, why we're sacrificing our health for our work is because through our work, we're trying to gain an identity. We're trying to prove that we're a somebody, that we have value, that we're worth something. But I want you to see this. Look what God gives us in the creation account. Genesis 2, verses 2 through 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now, sort of begs the question, why did God rest? Was he just tuckered out from all that, you know, creating things out of nothing thing that only he can do? By, by the way, we are, um, we are sub-creationists because we can only create things out of what God has already created, right? We can't create something out of nothing, only God can do that. So was he just tuckered out? It would have tuckered us out. But obviously, Scripture tells us that he neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's not in need of rest. But here's, here's what we see in the creation account. God is going to extreme lengths to show us what healthy human rhythms look like. Right? He knows that we learn best through modeling, through seeing it lived out. And so God is living out what a healthy human rhythm actually looks like. And so God, it says he set apart the Sabbath. He didn't need the Sabbath. He didn't need a day of rest. The Sabbath is for us. And if we are going to learn to approach our work from a place of a place of restfulness and a place of stability being centered on the truth of the gospel in any sort of healthy way, we have to learn how to Sabbath. We have to learn how to rest, how to live and work and rest in the rhythms that God designed us to. And in American culture, we are the worst at this. We are so bad. Listen, and I'm preaching to myself this morning. I need this. Right? It's not enough to just stop working. It's not enough to simply put it down. What we need is a deep inner rest and satisfaction in God that only God can provide. That's what we need. And listen, I've noticed this in myself. There are many times where I finish the workday and I'm on my way home and there is this restlessness and there's this anxiety feeling like, man, okay, am I, am I dropping a ball somewhere? Am I letting somebody down? And it just stays with me and I'm running through all the list of things that I'm trying to just manage. And, but listen, what the Sabbath does is it gives you space to turn that switch off and just go, God, I trust you. You've got it whatever it is. It, it, the Sabbath is a reminder. Some of us don't like this. The Sabbath is a reminder that the world doesn't need us to keep going. The world was just fine before you got, actually it wasn't, but <laughs> the world will keep going whether you're here or not. Right? God set apart the Sabbath as a weekly reminder that we are more than what we do. We are more than what we achieve or what we accomplish. In fact, um, this, uh, actually just yesterday, I, uh, I'm, I'm mowing my lawn and I'm listening to a podcast that uh, a new friend of mine, Eric Hoffman over at Fellowship Bible, he, he sent it to me. He, so it, it's this podcast and in it, John Mark Comer is being interviewed. He wrote a book uh, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I would strongly encourage you to get a hold of it and read through it because it's helpful in figuring out how to rest well. Anyway, in the interview, he might have been quoting somebody else, but he says, you know, in our culture, we, we live in a, a, a resume culture. So everybody is constantly trying to build their mountain of achievements so that they can go out into the world and say, look, look at all that I've done. I'm somebody. Or, or don't you want to hire me and pay me more money so that I can keep climbing the ladder? So that they're, they're appealing to a, a, another workplace. So he, he says, we live in a resume society, but what if we stopped living in a resume society and we actually began to live in a eulogy society? And you go, that sounds terrifying. What in the world does that mean? Well, he, here's what he meant. He said, what if, what if you wrote down on a piece of paper what you want someone to say at your funeral, to say about you, your eulogy. What if you just began to write down what you actually want said in your eulogy? Because what you're doing is you're actually defining what a successful life looks like. 
You're actually clarifying what success is. And if you start with the end in mind, which that's the end, if you start with the end in mind, you actually look at that and say, okay, now, is the life that I'm living today actually leading toward that kind of life? Is it actually aligned with who I want to become? And now, if you do this, which I would encourage you to, it has to be aligned, make it aligned with what Jesus wants for your life, the type of person that Jesus wants you to be, okay? Because I think God designed us, he's the one who gets to define what success looks like. So he goes, we, we need to stop living in a resume society and begin to live in a eulogy society and actually look at what, who do we want to become? Not just what we want to accomplish, who do we want to become? Who do we want to impact? What kind of life do we want to live? And that will change our priorities because we're not human doings, we're human beings, right? And the Sabbath is a weekly reminder from God of who we are. Now, Hebrews 4 says it this way, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God for whoever has entered uh, God's rest has also rested from his work as God did from his. So it's saying there's a rest available to us, but listen, it's not just a rest from work. It is a rest from work, but it's also a rest from self-justifying work. It's a rest from the anxiety that is linked in with our work. It's, It's a rest from the fear that we'll never be good enough, that we'll never amount to something. It's a rest from the fear that we'll never have approval or never belong or never be accepted. See, this is how the gospel affects your work because the gospel tells you that in Jesus Christ, you are beloved, you are a son, a daughter of the most high God, the king of heaven and earth. He has accepted you unconditionally. He has loved you. He has welcomed you in. Nothing is ever going to change that. You have belonging, you have approval, you have acceptance in Jesus Christ, so you no longer need to strive in order to earn that from somebody else. It's already yours in the gospel, right? So it changes the way that you approach your work. You don't have the anxious toil mixed in with it, right? Even the Pharisees, uh, uh, this is fascinating, they follow the Hebrew law so well, they were so well, I mean, they were structured and they were strict in following the law of God. They repented of the wrong things that they did. But Jesus comes on the scene and he's, he is more harsh with the Pharisees than he is with anybody else. Why? Well, if you just repent of the wrong things that you do, that's good. You should do that. We all should do that. But if you don't recognize that even in the good things that you do, there are mixed in with it selfish motivation, self-justifying motivation. It's not just repenting of the bad things that you do, it's repenting of the bad reasons for the good things that you do, right? And so Jesus comes along and he, he's hard on the religious people because they were, this is for somebody in the Southern Christian tradition right here, okay? They built an identity for themselves on religious adherence that was strictly motivated by selfishness and their need for self-justification. They were strictly following the rules in order to justify themselves. What this means is they did not love God. They used God in order to love themselves. Right, there was no love for God. Jesus says, "They, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Right, right? It's, it's saying that they don't love God, they love themselves and they're using God to do it. I, I wanna challenge you with something today. Could it be that your spiritual maturity as a follower of Jesus, could it be that your spiritual maturity is not determined by how hard you work for God but by how well you rest in God? by how much you accomplish for God, but how well you rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. See, if you rest well in the gospel, it lifts the burden off of you, doesn't it? That's how you tell you're actually trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ or not. Is it lifting the burden off of you or is it placing the burden on top of you? 
right? And this is how the gospel changes the way you approach your work. You're approaching your work not because you need something from it. You're, you're approaching your work ha- having all of your needs already met in everything that Jesus has already done for you. See, the gospel, it restructures the motivations for why you're doing what you're doing, why you're even doing your job in the first place, right? Because it's no longer about you. It's not about you. It's about serving people and loving God through how you're serving the community and working toward the common good, right? Because all work has inherent dignity and All inherently good work is a calling from God. So what do we do? How do we grow in this? How does the gospel work its way out in our work? And and here's here's the challenge. Observe the Sabbath. And we're not going to get legalistic about it. I mean, there's some of us, we look out at that and we go, man, that's impossible. Like, literally do no work. And there's like the Sabbath setting on your oven. You can even set it up that way and be so planned. Listen, if you can get there, great. But I, like, this is a challenge for me this morning because I'm, I'm not good at this and I need to get better, so I'm learning. But, but here's, here's the thing. If you observe the Sabbath, if you get in a weekly rhythm where you turn the work switch off for 24 hours and it doesn't, like if it's a Sunday, great. For me and my family, historically, we've tried to do Friday at six to Saturday at six. So it's a 24-hour period where the work switch is completely turned off. And you say, well, Rob, that's, that's irresponsible. That's negligent. That's bad stewardship. That's laziness. You know, that, that, that's careless. Listen, if that's your reaction to God's invitation to rest, what that's exposing in you is that you don't actually trust God. And, and what the Sabbath does is it, it exposes us and it expands. It exposes the, the areas of life where we're not fully trusting in God and gives us the space to actually converse with God about those things, right? So it gives space, it exposes, right, Ex- the things in us that God wants to work on, and it expands. It expands our ability to trust in God in those areas, right? It expands our faith. So if you do this, It reminds you that you are not needed to make the world go round. You're not just a cog in a wheel. And and listen, I'm just gonna challenge you in some specific ways. If you go rob 24 hours, that's impossible. Start somewhere. And maybe for you, today is your Sabbath. Go out to lunch, maybe take a nap. I don't know, but I'm gonna challenge you with something. This is gonna blow your mind for a second. Sabbath from your phone for the love of all that is holy. Sabbath from your phone. It's like tens, the average time an American touches their phone, it's like tens of thousands of times a day. It's insane. Okay, so turn your phone off. This is going to drive some of y'all crazy. Turn your phone off for an hour. Just start with an hour. Maybe 10 minutes. I don't know. But turn it off and set it aside. I'm telling you, you're going to notice. I mean, all of the attacks of the enemy are going to come like instantly, okay? That's how we know we have a problem, okay? So turn your phone off, Sabbath from your phone, start there. Take an hour away from electronics, away from your phone, and just simply spend a few moments saying, God, I'm inviting you into this time. Show me what you want to show me. Teach me, grow me, stretch me. Do what you want to do. I'm giving you this space. Start somewhere, But eventually, if you can work your way up to a 24-hour period of time where you are fully just all the work stuff is off, like it is going to revolutionize and change your life. I'm telling you, there's a reason why God set this up. And it's not because he was bored and just wanted to give us rules, right? God knows how we function and operate. This is an invitation to the life that he has designed us to live. And it, if you do this, listen, God in a, in a weekly Sabbath is going to remind you of the beauty, the power of the gospel. It's a weekly reminder of everything that Jesus accomplished for you. And if you do that, as you approach your work in the following days, you're going to be working not in order to earn rest. You're going to be working from a place of already being rested in God, Right, You will have a deep inner satisfaction with God and this is the way that Jesus has invited us to live. See, this is how the gospel 
works its way out in your work and the way it does is you have to make the priority of rest, of Sabbath rest. Y'all up for that? I know our culture, it's everything in Western culture works against this. And everything in you is gonna go, this is wrong. This is, like, this is just, I can't do, I'm telling you, there's a reason why God designed it this way. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the incredibly practical ways that you love us, you guide us, you lead us, you challenge us. And God, I, I, I know, um, I, I know this is, this is hard for us to implement in American culture, but God, I'm asking that you would give us your grace to prioritize resting in you, not just turning off the work switch, doing that, yes, but God, being with you, simply being near you, giving you space to come and speak, to change us, to challenge us, to stretch us, to reveal in us what you wanna work on. So many of us are so busy, we don't even have time to hear from you. And so God, would you help us with this? Would you give us grace where we fail? And God, would you help us to learn what you would have us learn as we try to obey you in this specific way? And as we do it, God, would you re revolutionize the way we approach our work not to try and earn a salary or earn an identity, but God, to simply serve the people around us. Do this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, church? Amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me know how it goes turning your phone off. I'm curious. Okay.